Okay, welcome everybody. I'm pleased to introduce today Blanca Osin, I hope I pronounce it correctly, uh, who's uh, uh, assistant professor at the University of uh, Salamanca in Spain uh, for the past two years now. And she's going to present um, a work as a paleosonographer and micropaleontologist entitled Nanofossil Records in Paleosonographic Studies from Qualitative to Quantitative. Blanca, ni uh, firstly, nice to meet you. And I'm really happy to, uh, to have you today. And uh, it, it's up to you now. Okay, so I think you can see my presentation here. Um, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here and present some of the work I've been doing over the last years, mostly here at Salamanca University, but also at ETH Zurich. And some of this work has only been possible with the uh, help of uh, many collaborators, some of them mentioned here, but of course, there is always many others. Um, I would like to start my talk with a video you've seen already in, in other nanotalks. And this is a clip of a cell of Coccolithus pelagicus, calcifying coccolith, right? But while this little critter is doing its homework, I would like you to think about its surroundings. So is it cold? Is it warm? Is it salty or turbid? Is it nutrient-rich or oligotrophic? And how was the CO2? These are very important questions because while this coccolithophore is calcifying calcite clays to build up a coccosphere, it is also meticulously recording all these conditions in both its inorganic and organic component. After the cell dies, the coccosphere disaggregates and some of its remains may fossilize in sediment. This is great news for us, right? Because they provide a precise record of the environmental conditions in which these organisms live. In other words, coccolithophore ecology is not just that. It is a powerful tool to explore past changes in ocean and climate conditions. So in this talk, I will be showing how we can explore coccolithophore ecology and use it to reconstruct past ocean conditions. Here in this first work, we studied two stations that are located in the Northwest Iberian margin, and so that is influenced by seasonal upwelling. One coastal station is called Raya, it's four kilometers offshore, and it's influenced by coastal processes like river discharges or winter storms. At each location, uh, well, sorry, and then the other station, which is Caliberia, which is an offshore station and it's not influenced by these coastal um, processes. At its uh, stations we measure several water properties like temperature or salinity by CTD profiling and we also sample sea water monthly at different depths uh, along a year. You can see these dots, black dots, these represent each of the water samples we took in order to measure uh, nutrients and also chlorophyll concentrations but mainly to identify and count coccolithophore elements. So here are our results. We counted both coccospheres that represents coccolithophore cells and also free coccoliths in the water column. And I will show you now the importance of counting both in order to have a better idea of the ecology of, of coccolithophores. So at both the stations, the number of coccospheres drastically drops below 50 meters water depth. And this is possibly due to rapid zooplankton grazing and um, also disaggregation of the coccosphere, right, into coccolith. But at Raya station, we can see that the higher number of cells is observed during the upwelling season. This is a spring or beginning of the summer, but there is also a maximum of the number of coccoliths during the downwelling region, close to the seafloor, which is 75 meters. Because of the environmental conditions during the downwelling regime are not favorable for coccolith for growth, and because there are no coccospheres nor other coccoliths over this depth that can explain settling of coccoliths, 
we believe that they might have been laterally transported from nearby locations or rest suspension of coccolids from underlying sediment. So this observation agrees uh, with the occurrence of uh, coastal processes like a storm event, but also riverine discharges. Consequently, the autochthonous coccolid assembly tier is masked in the water column, and we cannot use this station or the results of this station to explore ecology. However, the story is a bit different in Caliberia. This is the offshore station where we can see that the uh, highest abundance is modulated by the seasonal upwelling or the dwelling regime. Higher abundances are seen during a spring summer when there is high irradiance levels as are marked here by these errors and also optimal conditions for coccolith for growth. But mostly uh, they occur during um, warmer waters that are depleted in nutrients despite being the upwelling system. When we compare the abundance of some of the major species with the water column properties, we can already see some visual uh, correspondence. For example, the small Jephirocapsa group that you can see here shows two blooms that agree very well with highest chlorophyll concentration. So we could already see that this uh, uh, taxa is indicating higher primary productivity. On the other hand, we can see the Florisfera profunda, at least in Caliberia station, uh, blooms at deeper waters than other species when the nutricline is located at greater depth. Emiliania Huxleyi seems to show preference for more stable, warmer, and nutrient poor waters but during the upwelling system. So, whereas these visual correlations or comparisons are perfectly valid, sometimes they may lead to data misinterpretation. So, a statistical analysis are very welcome at this stage just to verify the robustness of of our interpretation. For this reason, we perform a CCA, a canonical correspondence analysis, only at Caliberia Station. Let's keep in mind that, that Raya was influenced by coastal processes, uh, masking any relationship of the coccolith for assemblage with uh, its environment, right? Or at least the environmental conditions we are looking at. On this CCA, environmental variables are represented by errors. The larger the error, the larger uh, the environmental gradient. And then the relationship of each species with the environmental conditions is shown by its relative position in the CCA. The species are marked by black stars. For example, uh, Emiliania Huxleyi is linked to the upwelling relaxation conditions. This is uh, it blooms during the upwelling regime, but mostly related to uh, more stable waters, let's say when the waters are already warmer and nutrient poor. Okay, but then on the other hand, we can see that a small Euphirocapsa is also related to the upwelling regime, but um, to more or colder waters and higher nutrient availability. So despite the common affinity of Emiliania Hasleai and small Euphirocapsa for the upwelling regime, they seem to have a distinct preference for different stages of the upwelling event. Jeffrey Recapsa Oceanica shows a clear preference for colder, high nutrient uh, waters during the upwelling season. We can see here that it's located uh, very close to these uh, nutrient hours and also the upwelling index, but very far away or at the other or the opposite uh, sense of the uh, temperature. Conversely, Florisfera profunda shows affinity for the then welling regime and low productivity conditions. And finally, Syracosfera genius is linked to warmer oligotrophic waters during the non upwelling system. What is important is that this information and coccolith for distribution and temporal variations is of great use to qualitatively interpret uh, nanofossil records in terms of past dynamics of the upper water column. And uh, this is something I would like to do in the following uh, work. So here we used over 200 samples from core Shack 6 5K, located at the classic Shackleton site in the Southwest Iberian margin. It's marked here by these little tiny red stars. Uh, apologies for that. 
And um, it is densely dated. You can see here all the radiocarbon dates that uh, we produce for uh, this, um, this, this uh, eight-step model that covers the last 28 kilo years. And this includes the last glacial maximum and all the abrupt events uh, that occur during the last glaciation, like in which is the one, Bolin, other road, Young with Bias, and so on. We combine nanofossil records with uh, oxygen and carbon stable isotopes, XRF records, and ice rafter debris. I don't want to go into the details regarding paleoclimate reconstructions, but from all the changes we observed, I would like to highlight the importance of nanofossil records to reveal centennial scale oceanographic changes during Hindrich Stadial 2 and 1 that we didn't uh, observe before. So for those that are not familiar with these periods, Hindrich Stadials in the Southwest Siberian margin are cold and arid episodes characterized by the arrival of iceberg melting water, but also the deposition of ice rafter debris. This is mineral grains, like the ones that you can see in this sample that can have different colors and, and sizes, and that have been transported by melting icebergs traveling across the North Atlantic from um, high to lower latitudes. In the Western Iberian margin, there are several paleoceanographic interpretations during Hinrich stadials, and they don't agree very well. For instance, um, high primary productivity has been explained uh, by turbulent mixing produced by these icebergs, or the southward penetration of nutrient-rich waters or nutrient input by fluvial discharges. But there are other proxy records that for the same period indicate low primary productivity. And this has been explained uh, by other authors to, um, or due to upwelling uh, weakening linked to a strong surface water strategy. We will see now how coccoliths uh, can help us to unravel uh, this scenario. In our study, we observed that some of the proxy records exhibit a bimodal distribution during both Henrich Stadials, uh, Henrich Stadial 2 and Henrich Stadial 1, and uh, this deserved further attention. For instance, uh, we can see the double peaks in Florisfera profunda lead to decreases in the end ratio. The end ratio is just a proxy for the nutriclean depth and is based on the abundance of uh, uh, Florisfera profunda that likes to live at deeper waters and uh, other uh, primary, well, coccolithophora species like Emiliania haxleae and small capsa that live in the upper photic zone. So on the, the higher, or, or let's say, yes, the, the higher the, the end index, the shallow is the neutral line and the lower, the deepest. And we can see here that there are some periods during Hendrix Stadial 2 and Hendrix Stadial 1 in which we have deepening of the neutral line. This deepening coincides with a higher delta, certain sea excursions marked by red dots as well. And uh, those are interpreted as upwelling weakening, right? So how can we explain this? Um, what we did uh, was to attribute these changes in the nutriclean and upwelling uh, strength to the arrival of milk waters because uh, fresher surface waters are expected to promote a stronger halocline and suppress wind induced upwelling and inhibit primary productivity. And this is consistent with the overall low coccolithophore productivity observed for both records, right? However, during the Real arrival of icebergs, which is marked by these uh, uh, maxima in ice rafter debris, we observe the opposite scenario. The end index uh, goes up. That means that the, the nutriculin is shallower. And also there is uh, concurrent excursions of the uh, carbon isotopes that indicates higher upwelling or stronger upwelling. So we explain this as the arrival of icebergs producing um, some mixing. Because uh, coccolithophore productivity is still low, it might be possible that this turbulent mixing during iceberg drift might account for such variations in the nutriclean depth and upwelling intensity. Whereas for the coccolithophores, it's uh, difficult to thrive in, in those conditions where only a few species like Emiliania haxleae large or Coccolithus 
Pelagicus pelagicus would find optimal growth conditions. So given that certain primary producers like dinoflagellates or diatoms can outcompete coccolithophores under medium and high turbulent conditions, the proposed scenario and these centennial scale variations uh, that we find in the nanofossil records allow us to reconcile previous contrasting productivity interpretations for this study area. So in sum, coccolithophore assemblages are really sensitive to changes in the environment in, in which they flourish. And thus, um, nanofossil records are excellent recorders of rapid changes in past environmental conditions. However, there are some assumptions we make in qualitative studies that may introduce important inaccuracies in our interpretation. For instance, we tend to extrapolate environmental affinities, regardless of specific adaptations to environmental changes. Or we based our interpretations in variations of collinear variables, uh, rather than the true variable that it's really controlling the coccolith of abundance. Or we also use the number of coccoliths rather than the number of coccospheres, because these are rarely preserved in fossil records. Some of these issues can be overcome by using transfer functions that were firstly implemented by Imri and Kip in the 70s. And uh, afterwards, they were used by the CLIMAP project to reconstruct global sea surface temperature. Since then, this method has been routinely employed in an increasing number of paleoceanographic studies using microfossil sensor scans. Some of the most used microfossil groups include planktonic foraminifera, from which we can derive temperature, productivity, or sea level, but also diatoms, dinoflagellates, or radiolarians. Coccolithophores, too. And, uh, this is because they are one of the major components of phytoplankton. However, there, there are ecological intricacies and it's difficult for us sometimes to use coccolithophore transfer functions. And for this reason, it, they have not been systematically employed in paleoceanographic studies. In the following, I want to show you two of our studies that demonstrate the potential of coccolithophores to perform quantitative paleoceanographic reconstruction. But first, what's a transfer function or a climate transfer function? Transfer function is based on the calibration of modern relationship between an, a specific organism or a specific species um, with the environmental conditions. Afterwards, this information can be used to reconstruct past environmental variables. A little bit in, in, in more detail, uh, this is what we would need to apply or to develop a transfer function. We need a modern training set. This is a calibration data set that has two parts. First, um, surface sediments or sediment traps from which we can perform census counts, in our case, coccoliths, and also in an environmental data set that is contemporary to these samples. And uh, this will be composed of different variables like temperature, salinity, oxygen, nutrient concentrations, and so on. Once we have this uh, training set, we can develop a transfer function, but we need a record to apply it, right? So we also need a fossil uh, data set, which is based on fossil sensors of nanofossils from down core samples. This would be this part here. Afterwards, we will apply the uh, obtain calibration to this uh, fossil data set in order to reconstruct a specific uh, variables or environmental variables. In this study, I, I will show you an example for the um, Western Mediterranean, which is characterized by very strong latitudinal gradients of water properties uh, determined by the entrance of the Atlantic waters through the Strait of Gibraltar. The model training set has two groups of data, as I said before, the coccolithophore species census counts based on mostly or over uh, 90 samples. And uh, then the environmental variables that includes uh, different variables that have been obtained from uh, ocean data view software and average annually and seasonally for summer and winter and selected for different depths. We also use a fossil data set, 
with uh, over 300 down core samples to which we will apply the uh, transfer function that we get with our calibration data. But first, we need to explore and calibrate the relationship between coccolithophores and the environment. And the question that arises here is which variable can be reconstructed? For this, we apply a, a principal component analysis, including all the environmental variables that could explain coccolithophore distribution in the modern training set. You can see the results here. At first, we would need to identify the variables that explain the variance in the coccolithophore training set independently. In other words, we want to exclude collinear variables because they introduce redundant information and complicate the interpretation of the analysis. For example, here, we can see that all these gradients are correlated. So for this, we applied a statistical analysis that is called a Kaikis information criterion that um, was used to identify the minimum number of variables that being statistically significant explain the maximum variation in the modern coccolithophore assembly. These were salinity, nitrate, phosphate, silicate, and oxygen. But we can only reconstruct one variable, right? So we need to keep looking. And for this, we perform a canonical correspondence analysis, where the vector show that salinity is the one that exhibits, exhibits the longest gradient. And also is strongly correlated with CCA1, that indicates a strong relationship with coccolithophore distribution. But still, we don't know which of these variables is the one that is the mo more important or the most important to uh, explain uh, the variability in our coccolithophore data, right? So for this, we uh, also perform individual CCAs that uh, indicate that salinity is the uh, strongest um, variable because many coccolithophore species thrive within specific ranges of the photic zone and are subject to environmental seasonality, we need to find as well the most suitable calibration. And this is based on the depth and season that most influence the fossil assemblage. So for this, we calculate the amount of downcore core variance explained by the summer, winter, and annual salinity reconstructions at nine different depths. And their statistical significance reveal that the mean annual reconstruction um, at 10 meters explain the highest variance. And this is the variable that we are going to reconstruct. Annual mean sea surface salinity, uh, well, the surface uh, for 10 meters depth. But you might be thinking is sea surface salinity ecologically possible? Uh, one would expect, or, or at least us, we're expecting to, to find nutrient concentration or temperature uh, to be the strongest variable, but we found uh, surface salinity. And uh, statistical results mean very little if they are not supported by true ecological relationships, right? Um, so then we start to dig into literature and we found that salinity has proven to be important to other um, marine planktonic groups, such as diatoms or dinoflagellates. And there is plenty of evidence out there for the direct relationship between variant salinities and the morphology of Emiliania Huxleyi, not only in surface uh, sediment samples, but also culture experiments. This is our, these are some examples, but there are many others that point at the strong influence of salinity on molecular compounds that are produced exclusively by coccolithophores like alkenons. So here we propose that the assemblage composition may be conditioned by the optimum salinity range preferred by each species. And we must remember that this is a semi- So now that we know that we can significantly reconstruct salinity, we can develop a transfer function. So we use the weight average partial least squares and the modern analog techniques. These are just two different models and we compared both of them. But both methods uh, showed similar quality predictions. They were actually pretty good. R square is between uh, 0.8 and 0.8.
to one line that indicates perfect prediction. And uh, also the residuals are distributed around zero and show no apparent uh, pattern. So they indicate that both models show good fit and adequacy. In the end, we, we end up using the weight average parcel squares to perform our uh, C surface salinity reconstruction. But the next question that we made ourselves were if this reconstruction was reliable or not. So for these, um, we um, used we, we applied a principal component analysis to our fossil record, which shows the most important changes in the composition of the fossil coccolito, for example. And we compared with our reconstruction. If uh, the salinity was the variable that was driving coccolito for variability over this period, then both records should be similar, as we see here in this graph, especially for the last uh, 16 kilo years. They diverge a little bit more for other periods. We also compared our reconstructions with Uh, previous records, there are some different uh, resolution in our records compared to previous uh, salinity reconstructions. In general, we see uh, can be used in paleoceanographic um, interpretations, right, compared with uh, other proxy records and, uh, and, and so on. What uh, we've just shown here is that uh, this regional transfer function that has been uh, implemented in this work could be used to reconstruct sea surface salinity in any core retreat from the Western uh, Mediterranean and included in, in paleoclimate records. The transfer function based on microfossil assemblages are not the only option. There are a specific species that show a clear affinity for distinct environmental conditions in relation to their fellows in the same uh, plankton group. This is the case of Florisfera profunda, which I'm sure all of you know. Um, Florisfera profunda is a coccolithophora species that inhabits in the lower photic zone. Uh, typically below the depth uh, chlorophyll maximum of the tropical and subtropical oceans. And contrary to the majority of uh, other extant coccolithophora species, high abundances of Florisfera profunda are linked to a deep nutricline. This would be this estuary in which they are all happy and then they bloom because the nutricline is uh, located at deeper position. And then it's related to lower uh, productivity. On the contrary, whenever we have a shallow nutricline, that means high net primary productivity, Forisfera profunda is a little bit sad and prefers not to be there as depicted here in this beautiful comic by um, Mariam Saavedra Pelitero and Ivan Hernandez Palmeira. This conceptual model in which uh, Florisfera profunda only blooms uh, whenever the nutricline is deeper and there is a lower net primary productivity was applied on surface sediment sample data sets um, to reconstruct down core primary productivity, at least here in the uh, low latitude Indian Ocean by a pioneering work by Luc Bufort in the 1997 um, and afterwards by other outputs. So these studies were followed by others in different basins, all obtaining quite different calibration or equation calibration. So, we wanted to go global and uh, we had different aims. Uh, the first one was to delimit the, the current biogeographical distribution of Florisfera profunda in all the oceans. We also wanted to assess the robustness, uh, robustness of Florisfera profunda relative abundance and net primary productivity relationships across different oceans or regions. And finally, we wanted to develop a calibration model that allows a quantification at the global scale of net primary productivity changes. We compiled data on Florisfera profunda relative abundance from 1,300, I think, or 250 more or less surface sediment sample and 26 sediment rocks located across a wide latitudinal range in all main uh, oceanic basins. 
Spatial distribution of Floresfera profunda relative abundance clearly shows uh, decreasing values towards higher latitude in both hemispheres. Net primary productivity and sea surface uh, salinity are highly correlated with the distribution of Floresfera profunda in surface sediment. And this is because these two variables relate to the position of the nutricline in the, in the case of uh, net primary productivity or the stratification of the water column in the case of sea surface sediment. But more importantly, their correlation with the Floresfera profunda reveals different trends depending on the latitudinal band. Our results uh, show that Floresfera profunda uh, is highly correlated with net primary productivity between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, while at higher latitudes shows a higher um, relationship with temperature. Based on these results, we developed a global calibration model between satellite net primary productivity estimates and Floresfera profunda for this latitudinal band only, the one that is uh, um, comprised between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And here is our calibration model. The blue line represents the logarithmic regression. The R square is uh, 0 0.54. And the gray shaded area shows the residual standard error, which is approximately 0 0.63. Afterwards, we use Floresfera profunda abundances from uh, 94 sediment cores covering the last glacial maximum. This is uh, from 22 up approximately uh, kilo years, but also uh, some of them uh, cover the mid to late uh, Holocene period, which is the last six. Thousand years. And with this, we wanted to apply our calibration model and track the past abundance of Floresfera profunda and reconstruct net primary productivity variation. These reconstructions, here you can see the results, shows that net primary productivity was higher during last glacial maximum compared to the uh, mid to late Holocene at low latitudes increasing uh, carbon fixation and possibly impacting CO2 levels. And uh, this is my last slide. And this is the take home message that I have for you, that uh, coccolithophores have proven great potential for transfer function development. And although uh, performing qualitative uh, studies is perfectly valid, sometimes uh, sorting to a statistical analysis is Good in order to, to test the robustness of our reconstruction. Existing coccolithophore based transfer functions, like the ones I've shown before, are very useful tools to reconstruct past oceanographic and climate changes. However, a uh, broader understanding of coccolithophore modern but also past ecologies is still needed to understand some of the relationships we get when we perform a statistical analysis. Now, I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Blanca. Uh, yeah, it was a great presentation. Um, is there anybody having a question? Um, whether you raise hand or you write in the chat? OK, just waiting a few minutes, like everybody is clicking on the right uh, button to uh, get online. <clears throat> no, uh, let me just check the end rising uh, tool here. Okay, so I will start the questions then uh, myself, but I have this, I, I always ask the same question. So I'm really sorry, I have to ask. Um, in the, the first study you showed, um, you, you showed the, uh, the N index, um, uh, if I, I remember well, which is, uh, I checked quickly, uh, small placolites and small placolites of Floresfera percentage uh, ratio, something like that. And I saw that it was, there were variation between 0 0.8 and 1 on that ratio. And I wonder uh, how, uh, how confident are you that you are uh, 
over any uncertainties in those variations because it's quite narrow over uh, over the total range of the ratio. So, do you have any idea uh, on that aspect? Yeah, I guess um, the interpretation of this index depends on the location because, for example, in my region, if we find uh, just five percent of Florisfera profunda, it's it can be considered a relatively high percentage, let's say. So this will drive very uh, little changes in the in ratio, but still it's it's an important change uh, regarding the coccolithophore assemblies. Whereas if we go to other locations where Florisfera profunda can be more abundant, up to 30%, then these variations will be different. And, and this is why this uh, uh, interpretation of the end index is just qualitatively and uh, it has to be taken with, uh, with, with care and depending also in the location that we are. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else having a question? No, please. Ah, Mario has a, has a question. So Mario, we listen to you. Hi all. Uh, well, thank you very much, Blanca. It's uh, great, great work. I'm full of envy of your work <laughs> in a good sense. It's a very good um, approach and I enjoyed it very, very much. Well, so many uh, questions, but I, I uh, would like to put you a question that uh, is related with one of the texts that you mentioned. Uh, that is concerning me in general, is that uh, Gephyrocaps, small Gephyrocaps and Emiliania, they were plotted in one of your graphs, were plotted nearby, but nevertheless a bit apart. So uh, they more or less mean the same, but not exactly. Uh, and one question is that, um, could that explain, for instance, that we have so we are so we we so easily can culture Emiliani Axley, and we have very very few data from cultures for uh, the small Gephyrocapsa, for instance. They should, uh, I, I mean, they should behave more or less the same in cultures, and and we ha we should have a lot of information about the small Gephyrocapsa as we have for Emiliani, but we don't. I mean, we have a lot from Emiliana, especially from biologists. They, they, they like it very much. But the small Gephyrocaps that from our record should be more or less similar. Uh, well, things don't happen the same way. Do you have an idea why you have a feeling about it? Well, first, I think that, that people that work culture in Emiliania Huxley does it so easily because others did it before, right? So we just keep doing what the others did. And um, but then on the other hand, what you said about the, their specific or, or different preferences during the welling season might be related to that. What, what I could see, not only by visual uh, comparison of my uh, coccolithophore assemblages with the environmental data set, but also by a statistical analysis, is that both of them like the upwelling season, right? But they're a little bit different because Emiliania Huxley likes to be there when the waters are already a little bit more warmer and stable. That could be the end of the upwelling period. Let's remember that my sampling period is just one day. We went there, we took one sample, and then we came back. So it's the upwelling season, but still, it could be a period in which it's already relaxed. And then for the small Gephyrocapsa group, what we saw is that they also liked the upwelling season, but when there were more nutrients and it was more active, and we could also see, I didn't show it here, that we could also see diatoms in the, in the assemblage. While whenever we, we found Emiliania Huxleyi, there were not many diatoms because the waters were already a little bit more stratified. So there are distinct ecological preferences that we could distinguish with this statistical analysis, but I, I cannot give you an answer for, for your question about cultures. Uh, I guess maybe people should try with uh, different levels of nutrients, for example, and also colder temperatures. Okay, thanks. 
Thanks so much. Um, okay, we have a question in the chat from uh, Laura Bonzo, uh, who asked, uh, what about reworked species? Did you saw some variations? Um, you mean in the uh, in the seawater samples or in fossil records? I, 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 Laura. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm asking uh, Laura. Sorry. Fossil record. Um, yes, uh, we did. I I'm not sure if I show it here. Let me just uh, go back to my presentation. You are still hosting, so that's fine. Yeah. Okay, let me go back. I just want to see if I show it here in this graph. Um, yeah, so rework the specimens. Uh, what I usually find, especially in this region, in the Southwest Iberian margin, is that uh, they become more abundant in the uh, nanofossil assemblage during Cambridge stadials. And uh, this has been attributed to uh, lateral transport by intermediate nepheloid layers uh, during these periods, because the intermediate nepheloid layer was uh, a little bit deeper, and then it was raining these laterally transported part particles over our side. So what you see here, this gray line is the relative abundance, whereas what you see here in the dark gray uh, or, or solid uh, gray plot is the absolute abundance. So absolute abundance is higher during the less glacial maximum, but they become more important or they, they represent a higher percentage during Cambridge's stadial. And um, well, we attribute it to this, but this is not uh, uh, our idea. Let's say there are other works. Uh, I think the author is Ferrero, maybe 2008, that um, uh, this is a very beautiful study in which they show that the reworked nanofossils in the Gulf of Cadiz uh, come from redistribution of, of sediments. And uh, then these uh, uh, assemblages here must be taken with caution because uh, we may find high percentage of, of reworked uh, nanofossils that uh, don't belong to the region and therefore are allotonous components of the sediment. Any other questions? Oh, excuse me. Um, yeah, any other questions? I do have one, uh, another one, sorry. Uh, um, Martha Martinez has a question about me, so you go first. Okay, just, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you Hello. can see me. Um, uh, hello to everyone, and thank you, um, Langa, for your presentation. I celebrated uh, the pass from qualitative to quantitative, you know. Um, maybe you, you say something about, about that, but I have a question uh, about the cocolid assemblages. Um, you, use, you use the modern nutrient concentration to reconstruct the, the pass water conditions, but it's a question, um, you know, but <laughs> there are any study where the modern coccolito four are collected or in the Gulf of Cadiz, because uh, it, could, it, could, it could be possible. I don't know if, if there are something there. It, you mean Compare, from the you know, water, right? Yes, modern water. Yeah, so usually for the uh, calibration data set, we use surface sediments because this is what uh, most of us do, right? We work with sediments and it's very rare that uh, we can find uh, seawater um, samples with uh, also um, the measurement of the environmental or all the environmental variables that we want. Imagine that we go um, on a cruise and then we take some seawater samples, I could measure nutrients, I could measure temperature and salinity, but what about all the others? What about the alkalinity, pH and so on? Sometimes we miss this, uh, this, uh, this information. 
in the last work that I show you by Ivana Hernandez Almeida, nevertheless, um, we also used some um, data from sediment traps. And that means collection of, of uh, coccolids that were traveling in, in, in the water. And for these, rather than in situ measurements of, of these properties, we use uh, satellite measurements that were average for the periods of the sediment traps. So this might be a little bit difficult and you need uh, to be really like working on the data sets a lot because you need to find the period and also to average it for that period, also the water depth and so on. And it takes a little bit more work, but it's possible. But in general, I would say that all of us work with uh, surface sediment. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that you are making a good, good job, but I have that question because I, I have some, some sample of water, but I will write you, you know. <laughs> but thank you for your presentation, Blanca. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, thank you very much. Um, is there any other question? Otherwise, I will ask mine. Uh, actually, uh, when you were uh, showing us the, um, uh, your, it was the 2015 uh, work you showed us, I guess, on the salinity, and you show the different parameters uh, uh, and change between uh, the, the seasons, if I remember well. You were winter and summer. And uh, only, I had the feeling that only the salinity was stable during whole year, how does that affect the fact that maybe, is it because it's that stable that you have the salinity that is this significant in your calculation at the end? Yeah, that, that could be a possible reason. This is something we explain in the article. And it's not only that there is uh, evidence uh, for the relationship of coccolithophores with salinity, but also because our study site is a little bit uh, special in this way. It's in the Western Mediterranean where salinity is very important. The uh, hydrological budget in this semi-enclosed basin is negative. That means that there is more evaporation than precipitation. And therefore salinity is, is really, really important, much more than other variables. And as I show you in these uh, gradients, it's, it varies very little. So it might be that salinity is, um, this annual um, um, salinity gradient is overprinting seasonal variations in other variables that are also affecting the coccolithophore assemblage. But in the end, what we really want is to find a variable that uh, explains the majority of, of variation in our coccolithophore data. And uh, with this, I mean that, um, that we could use this uh, transfer function in the Western Mediterranean, that outside it might not make sense. I mean, first, we could not use it because uh, there is not a, a calibration data set that includes other sites. But even if we could do the same in other regions, I don't think we would find salinity to be the most important uh, variable driving variance in the coccolithophore data. Okay, thank you very much. Um, sorry, anybody else having a question then? Uh, please feel free to ask all the questions you want. And uh, okay, so I guess we we have no more questions. So. Uh, I would like to uh, thank very much uh, Blanca for the very nice presentation she made today and uh, for accepting, of, of course, to, to do this presentation uh, through NanoTalk. Uh, congratulations to you. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for coming to those NanoTalks. And I would like to say that next one will be in December, mid-December. Just give me one sec on the date that we have picked it just the day I picked earlier, I forget. It will be by Rosie Sheward, uh, and it would be, I don't remember the date. We will send it by email. Uh, I think it is 14th of December. Uh, and she will, her talk is entitled Coco Under Climate Change. Uh, that's it, I cannot tell more, more about that. So it will be in uh, in about a month. And uh, I guess that's it. Thank you very much, Blanca. 
and I hope to see you next to uh, next month uh, in the next Nano Talk. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I wish you everybody good evening, morning, whatever, wherever you are. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.